Well, good afternoon and welcome to the World Affairs Council of Orange County's session today, which will be a panel discussion on obtaining and enforcing intellectual property rights worldwide, a view from the front line. Uh, we're very grateful to the Noby Martins Law Firm for sponsoring this event today. And we're delighted to have a, this panel of experts with us today for I, what I know uh, will be a very interesting and uh, engaging event for all of you. Uh, I'm Dr. Richard Downey, I'm the chairman of the Programs Committee for the World Affairs Council of Orange County, and it's a real pleasure to have all of you with us today. Um, we are looking forward to a very lively and engaging uh, discussion, and we can have that uh, with you. We want all of you to be a, a part of that, and you can do that by going down to the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen, uh, there at the bottom right of your screen, and at any time during the presentation, you can uh, ask a question of the panelists. And there'll be a, a panel discussion, but at the end, uh, there will have a period for Q&A. And John Skanga, who is a partner at Noby Martins, will host the Q&A uh, uh, for all of you, for all of your questions. So again, anytime throughout this session, feel free to ask a question, and we'll get to that at the end. Um, I should mention that the World Affairs Council of Orange County is a nonpartisan organization. We don't take any position in institutional positions on issues of public debate, uh, but we do want to have our members be informed. And so we try to present perspectives on all sides of the issue. Uh, and talking of our members, uh, if you're a member, thank you. We, are, we appreciate that. If you are not a member, we would really appreciate you joining. Uh, like most organizations during the pandemic, uh, it has been a tough, uh, tough hit for us. So uh, if, you were, if you would join the World Affairs Council of Orange County, we would be very grateful to you. And now is a very good time to join since there's a discount uh, on membership and it's not too much anyway, but we would uh, greatly appreciate you going to the website. It's very easy to do. Just click on the membership button and it's and uh, to be a member. And this is a, a very good time as well because we're starting in-person events later on this month. Our first one in well over a year will be later this month for our trustees. So um, please uh, take the opportunity to become a member. Uh, and now let me introduce Judge Jim Gray, who is a former chairman of our World Affairs Council of Orange County Board and a very distinguished jurist and author in his own right. Uh, but uh, Judge Gray is a former presiding Superior Court Judge of Orange County amongst a, a number of very high level legal positions, uh, too many to name right here. But he's also received many recognitions for the legal work that he's done and many Keep of the short, innovative Richard. kinds of short. legal approaches that he has, uh, that he has introduced. Uh, he's also a, uh, a former, uh, he's actually the Libertarian Party's uh, former vice presidential nominee in 2012 and uh, also ran for president in 2020. So we are, we are really honored to have Judge Gray with us today to, to introduce our panel. Judge Gray, let me pass the microphone over to you. Before I do, let me say one more time, thanks to uh, Noby Martins for being our sponsor for today. So please, Judge Gray, thank you. Well, Dr. Richard, thank you for all of that. Uh, I think it was a little exaggerated, but I'll take what I can get. I actually am not a politician. As I say, I have the votes to prove it because I haven't won any of those elections. So, so there we go. But I, I expect that all of our listeners are pretty much in my vote that uh, I am not particularly gifted with regard to intellectual property and, and even uh, what, what's going on here to the degree that, uh, candidly, I hold the founders of our Constitution really liable for this, that, that they failed us. They never anticipated the airplane. They didn't anticipate the internet or computers. I mean, how do we have these issues now addressed through our, through our institutions? Well, uh, I'm also here to tell you that talk about my, my precise information. Uh, many of you probably do not know this, but the World Health Organization actually determined quite quickly with this epidemic on the, the uh, coronavirus the virus, 
and the dogs could not carry or transmit this virus. So that they ordered no dogs be quarantined and actually any dogs in cages be released. So now we know who let the dogs out. That's the extent of my uh, intellectual activity today. But I can tell you that we do have experts here with us. I'm pleased to say that uh, I spoke with John Skanga of Kenobi Martins, Olson and Bear. Uh, these guys really do know what they're talking about. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we're fortunate to have them here. I asked if they would share their information with us at the World Affairs Council of Orange County. Now it's gone really nationwide. I know that the World Affairs Council of, of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina is also involved. Uh, our Orange County Bar Association has our intellectual property section as well as the uh, the uh, international law section watching it as well. So we, we do have questions, ask as you go. And we have a strong panel of people here, uh, a partner in Kenobi Martins, Olson and Bear, Barack Kloff, also Vladimir Losan, and certainly then John Skanga. And we're also blessed to have Johnson G, who is uh, actually of the uh, Intel, Uni Unitel managing partner. Uh, in China. So with that, John, thank you for being with us. I'll pass it on to you to more fully introduce your pan our panel members. And uh, I'm going to just sit back and sit figuratively at your feet and listen and take notes. So John Skanga, thank you for being with us. And the microphone now is yours. Thanks, Judge Gray. And uh, it, this uh, program would not be happening if it weren't for uh, Judge Gray's insights. So uh, I want to thank him uh, not only for the intro, but for uh, his vision. And uh, Dr. Downey, thanks for uh, your support as well. So uh, we have uh, a panel of four uh, intellectual property lawyers, and, and we, we are coming to you uh, uh, internationally here uh, from uh, Beijing, New York, Southern California, uh, which is appropriate for our topic. Um, three of us are partners at the Kenobi Martins Olson & Bear firm. Uh, we, we specialize entirely in intellectual property. Uh, Barack Hoff uh, is my partner, and he litigates intellectual property disputes. So if someone has uh, stolen your idea or your brand, uh, or you've been wrongly accused of doing that, uh, Barack will uh, go to court uh, and has done so in uh, various courts throughout the U.S. Uh, to enforce all types of intellectual property rights. And uh, before he started doing this, uh, he was actually working for IBM as a software engineer. So uh, he, he knows the law and the technology as well. Uh, also on the panel is uh, another a partner of mine, Vlad Lausanne. And uh, uh, Vlad's practice focuses on building intellectual property portfolios for his clients. And he, he does that on a worldwide basis. He gets not only patents and trademarks and copyrights, for clients in the US, but he, he does it uh, for those clients uh, worldwide. Uh, he advises them on also a variety of issues such as licensing uh, and uh, due diligence and, and other strategic matters that come up when you are trying to uh, make the most out of your intellectual property portfolio and avoid uh, being uh, in hot water, uh, getting sued by somebody for, for uh, infringing. Uh, somebody else's intellectual property. And uh, b before he uh, started his career as a, as a patent lawyer, uh, he was an engineer at uh, Chevron. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, uh, Johnson uh, uh, is with us all the way from, from Beijing. And uh, he's been uh, practicing IP law for close to 20 years now. And uh, before he did that, uh, he was uh, teaching college physics so great background for dealing with uh, a variety of different technologies, uh, such as uh, optics and telecommunications. And his practice is uh, quite broad. He, he not only helps uh, obtain uh, intellectual property rights in China, but he helps enforce them in, in China. And he does this not only for clients based in China, but, uh, but for clients worldwide. And he's been recognized for uh, his quality work by the uh, Beijing Patent uh, attorney Association as a star attorney and uh, recently had a very successful case at the Chinese Supreme Court that was uh, recognized as a case that should provide guidance for all Chinese courts. So we're really uh, appreciative that uh, he was able to join us a very, very early morning in Beijing his time. Uh, so uh, before we jump into it, I'll apologize in advance for uh, for any barking dogs that you might hear from from my end here. The uh, now that we know who let him out, uh, I'll, I'll, you, you'll know who it is that's making the noise if it's coming from my end. Uh, but uh, hopefully, not not much of an uh, interruption for us today. 
So why are we talking about intellectual property? Uh, other than the fact that the four of us on the panel do it for a living and, and, and love to do it for a living, uh, we thought it would be of interest for this group in particular because intellectual property is getting increasing attention as a key issue in America's global competitiveness. And what's, uh, what's interesting about that is, uh, you know, in general, the U.S. Uh, is, a, you know, obviously we're capitalistic and in general, we're promoting free marketplaces. Uh, intellectual property is, a, is kind of an interesting exception to the free marketplace idea. Uh, the idea is to promote innovators to come up with new uh, technology and, and, and new products. Uh, we're going to make an exception to the open marketplace and say, uh, you're going to have a limited period of exclusivity if you get a patent or a copyright. And we'll, we'll talk about all the various forms of IP. Uh, but that's an exception to the free marketplace. And uh, the, the policy reasoning behind it is that if we promote this innovation, we're going to get the benefit of uh, more products coming to market, more ideas being shared, people willing to go public. And uh, not only will the market get the benefit of these better products, but other competitors will be able to build on what they've learned from the innovators who have who themselves were motivated to share and and bring their products to market and and go public and that's really what a patent is it's op laying open to the public your technology in exchange for uh this uh exception to the competitiveness uh in the in the normal free marketplace now this isn't this isn't new uh, and uh, it's uh, something that the, the, our, our founders did think about in the Constitution. They, they said that they gave Congress the authority to create laws to protect uh, inventors and authors. That's about it. That's what I've said to you. I, I could quote the, <laughs> the Constitution. It doesn't say much more than that. <laughs> it's one sentence. Um, but in America in 1790, we enacted our first patent act and the roots of that were based on the British system and, and uh, the, the, the Brits weren't the first either. There were other Europeans who had done it before them. So we've got centuries really of this uh, experiment going on in terms of whether uh, making the exception to the free marketplace is, is a good thing uh, from a policy point of view. And I, I certainly uh, can tell you that, that I think it, it uh, is. Uh, and what, uh, what's a little newer uh, is the degree to which the, the IP laws of a given country are viewed as very critical to its ability to, to compete on a level playing field. Uh, and there have been a number of treaties uh, that we'll touch on briefly. There's been a lot of global cooperation between America and other large economies uh, to basically have a uh, relatively uh, friendly and, and cooperative system so that you can get protection for your intellectual property, not just here, but in other countries and vice versa. It, it is bilateral. Uh, and what we're seeing though is that uh, there's, there's competitiveness developing, you know, not, not only at the micro level between a patent owner and a competitor who may want to try to copy their patented product, but between, also between uh, intellectual property systems themselves. You know, and uh, businesses need to decide which countries to do business in and where they can get good IP protection is a factor in that decision. And they have to de decide how much money am I going to spend uh, to pay lawyers to help me get intellectual property protection? And where should I go? Should I, how many countries should I spend money in? It starts to get expensive. And so those decisions on where to devote the resources, where to build the markets, and then finally, where to go to start a lawsuit uh, if somebody has copied you. And more and more, we see uh, the competition being global. If you've got a great product in the US, uh, it's going to be copied not just here, it's going to be copied worldwide. And uh, that presents you as the IP owner with a choice. Where am I going to sue? Uh, everywhere in the world, in the US, et cetera. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the differences in, in those systems. And we're seeing competitiveness between countries and then even within the United States as to which court is going to decide it. There's a court in Texas that's hearing one out of five patent cases in the whole United States is is going to a, a, a federal courthouse in Waco, Texas. 
And why is that? Well, the, the folks in Texas think it's good for their local economy to have a lot of cases uh, going on there. So there's competitiveness at, at all different levels. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll shed some more light on this with our topic. So we're going to start off here. Uh, we'll talk what, what exactly are intellectual property rights. Uh, the, there's, uh, these are creatures of law. And Barra is going to talk a, a little bit about the different, uh, the different types that exist. And uh, I, I will uh, turn it over to, uh, to Barra here to, to pick up uh, with uh, his explanation on the different IP scenarios. Thanks, John. Uh, so I'll, I'll go, uh, my, my, I'm going to go with a, a, a basic primer as to what IP law is uh, so that we can all kind of be on the same, on the same starting point on a, at a level playing field here and, and understand the rest of the, the, uh, the discussion regarding protection and enforcement. Um, so, so first off, uh, if we could go back to slide four, please. Um, so first off, what are intellectual property rights? Uh, we're not just talking about patents. I know usually people, maybe first thing they think about is patents, but we're talking about in general, intellectual property rights are the exclusive right to, to certain intellectual products or products of the mind or ideas. Um, and they, uh, they can be uh, inventive ideas. They can be the physical appearance of objects. They can be source identifiers. Uh, they can be uh, commercial secrets or commercially valuable uh, ideas that are kept secret, uh, and they can be expressions of ideas. And we'll go into a little more detail uh, in just a moment. Uh, <clears throat> and having, uh, having those, uh, that exclusivity provides benefit to the intellectual property owner in the form of uh, value uh, as a, a valuable asset for a company or for an individual licensing revenue from, uh, from, from licensing that intellectual property protection from other people who might uh, be thinking about asserting their own intellectual property against you, uh, seeing that you're serious about, about intellectual property. And then finally, that, that valuable asset would, would attract uh, investors to your, your company or your brand. Um, so first we'll start off with patents. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. One more, thank you. Uh, so first we'll start off with patents. Uh, what are patents? Uh, a patent is essentially a legal document. Uh, if you've never seen one, the, the picture on the right side here is, a, is a, uh, the face of one design patent. Um, it describes, uh, the patent describes how to make and use an invention. Uh, typically it'll have uh, some, some drawings, it'll have some uh, uh, description, uh, sometimes rather lengthy description of what the invention is, some background. And then it will end with a series of claims that uh, essentially define the meets and bounds of what the invention is. Um, but in essence, it is the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, selling, or importing the claimed invention. Uh, it's a quid pro quo with the, with the government. The government says, tell the world how, what your invention is and how to make it, and we'll give you a, an exclusivity on that invention for a limited amount of time. Uh, there are three types of patents in the U.S., and, and I'll say in general, I'm, I'm, I'm basing my portion of the presentation on, on U.S. law. There, there could be some uh, parallels to other uh, parts of the world, but um, in general, this is based on U U.S. law. So utility protects uh, uh, innovations and discoveries for any new and useful processes and machines, essentially uh, something that's uh, functional. Uh, you'd protect that idea using a utility patent. You can protect the design which is the original and ornamental design uh, of an article of manufacture or plants. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, in general, just the anatomy of a patent, as I said, you'll have drawings, you'll have specifications and you'll have claims. Uh, patents uh, in the US, uh, utility and plant patents last for 20 years. Uh, design patents give you 14 years of protection. Uh, uh, my partner Vlad will go more into the process of obtaining uh, patent protection, but it, in general, you can apply for a, uh, a non-provisional, uh, using a non-provisional application or a provisional application, and then there's prosecution of the patent, which is essentially the negotiation process with the patent office. Um, and that process essentially looks like this. You, you have a, uh, an application that's prepared uh, by, typically by an attorney, will be submitted to the patent office. The patent office will perform its own 
searching for existing patent, uh, excuse me, existing uh, prior art or other uh, publications that may disclose what your invention is. Uh, and they'll negotiate with you as to what your invention really is or what you, you, you can claim uh, to be your invention. Uh, eventually, hopefully your patent will be issued uh, and then you can enforce it and maintain it. Next slide, please. Um, real quick, I'm not going into detail for these because each one of these could be its own hour presentation on its own. Uh, but basically the five requirements for patentability in the US are, uh, it has to be directed to, towards patentable subject matter. Uh, it has to be a useful article. Uh, you, uh, it has to be new, uh, that has never been done before. It has to be non-obvious uh, to, uh, to the person of ordinary skill in the art. Uh, and the, your, your disclosure has to, has, to be, uh, has to provide sufficient written description to convey that you were actually in possession of the idea uh, of the invention and that and to enable a person of ordinary skill skill in the art to uh, build and use your invention. Um, uh, then uh, once you have the patent, you can uh, assert uh, the, the patent against uh, infringers. Uh, inf infringement can be direct, uh, it can be induced, or it can be contributory. Uh, I think the names are probably self-explanatory. Um, direct is the, the person who actually commits the act of infringement is the one that you're enforcing against. Induced, meaning you're enforcing the patent against not the actual person who committed the infringement, but someone who is uh, um, inducing, uh, who's encouraging someone else. Uh, and then contributory is someone who provides uh, perhaps um, a, a portion uh, or of the, of the uh, product or method that's being um, asserted, of the patent that's being asserted. Um, Next slide, we'll talk about trademarks. Uh, a trademark is, as I hinted before, is, is a mark that identifies the source of, uh, of, the, uh, of origin of goods and services. It could be a word, a logo, color, sounds, um, and other things. Uh, in general, there, there is this, uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, a spectrum of protection for different words um, and, and, and uh, logos that you may be familiar with. Uh, the spectrum of, of uh, distinct, distinctiveness is what we call it. Um, on the very left side, you'll see the generic. A generic mark is, is, uh, is afforded no protection at all. On, on, the, on the right side is the, the fanciful mark, which is afforded the most protection. Um, and, uh, and in between, you have a, a descriptive, which is a, a mark that uh, merely describes an ingredient or a quality or a characteristic or a function or feature of the uh, um, of the uh, product or service that you're offering with, um, with that mark. Um, it includes laudatory terms, geographic designations. Uh, it, it's not inherently distinctive, meaning it can't be protected on its own uh, unless it acquires what we call secondary meaning uh, that's acquired through use uh, and promotion. So if somebody uh, uses the mark for a long period of time, uh, and uh, essentially educates the, the consuming public as to that, that word, that descriptive mark, uh, then it could be, uh, it could be protected. Uh, a suggestive mark, uh, we're still on that, that slide. A suggestive mark uh, is one that uh, requires a, a little bit of imagination in order to connect the mark with the product or service. Uh, it's, um, it, it has, uh, as the spectrum suggests, it's, it has more protection than a descriptive, uh, descriptive mark and more distinctiveness. Uh, it's what we consider inherently distinctive. Um, and those are marks like Netflix or Airbus, which you may not necessarily just by looking at the mark know exactly what it, what it refers to, but with some imagination, you'll make that connection. An arbitrary mark is uh, uh, a, a word that has a common meaning, but it has no relation to the, or to the product or service, that, or service um, with which it's being used, uh, such as Apple Computer or, or Dove for, for skincare products. Um, and then finally, the fanciful marks are made up words, coined words that have no meaning, uh, that, have the, the, uh, that are also inherently uh, distinctive and are afforded the broadest scope of protection uh, against third party use. Uh, I should note though that uh, uh, fanciful marks are sometimes in danger of becoming generic. Uh, and you may have heard a few examples of those such as uh, Xerox or cellophane or escalator. Uh, those are words that were at one point were, uh, uh, well, not escalator. Escalator was, was a, uh, a suggestive mark, but it became so prevalent as the, as the, the word for that, um, 
for that product that it ends up losing its distinctive distinctiveness. Um, so we'll go next slide. Um, the process of getting a trademark, uh, uh, you you uh, unlike a patent, uh, for, it, for to get a patent you have to apply for the patent, you have to submit an application. You don't actually have a patent protection until the patent issues. But with a trademark, all you really need to do is begin using the mark on your goods or services to establish at least common law rights in your um, in your mark. Uh, then to get additional protection and perhaps some some other benefits such as statutory damages. You could uh, register it with the with the uh, um, federal uh, you know, uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the next one after that, we'll talk about trade secrets real quick. Uh, a trade secret uh, is any commercial information, uh, products, or processes that provide economic advantage due to being kept secret. Um, it basically it uh, it gives you the rights to uh, prohibit misappropriation. Misappro misappropriation can be in the form of acquisition, disclosure, or use of the uh, of the trade secret. Um, and and it's important to note that knowingly receiving a trade secret can constitute misappropriation. And that would be in the typical case if a company hires someone knowing that that person is bringing with them trade secret information from their former employer and then uh, and then knowing that that person is going to disclose that information may make that company liable for misappropriation. Um, uh, trade secret is uh, in, in, in one, of, one of those uh, intellectual property rights that you also don't really uh, need to do anything in order to, uh, excuse me, you don't need to register anything in order to uh, get the protection. You do need to uh, take a few steps in order to, to make sure that your trade secret is kept uh, secret, uh, and that is to make reasonable efforts to keep the uh, the secret a secret, uh, and that could be through the use of a non-disclosure agreement, confidential agreement, uh, making sure that you uh, put the information under lock and key, uh, you know, either quite literally or under password protection, restricting access to, to, to the information to only people who need it, making sure the information is labeled as confidential or trade secret, um, uh, that's that's essentially what's needed. Uh, once you have information that you want to protect because it, it gains that value from being uh, from being secret, then uh, you take the measures to keep them secret, and and you have a trade secret. Um, uh, so in the next slide, I wanted to to give you a bit of a comparison between the uh, the patents and and trade secrets. If you recall, I I said that uh, patents are quid quo quo pro quid pro quo with the government where you agree to disclose your, your, uh, your idea. Uh, trade secrets are quite the opposite. You don't, you're not, you're, you're not disclosing it to anybody. You're keeping it uh, a secret. Um, so um, uh, there's also a difference in terms of, uh, in terms of the duration. A patent can only last 20 years, uh, whereas trade secret could be indefinitely as long as you're keeping up with your obligation to to keep the information confidential uh, and as long as it, it still has its value from uh, from being kept secret. Um, one important thing also to note as the difference between the two is is uh, for a uh, if a patent is being asserted, uh, you can exclude others from using the same idea, even if that idea is being, uh, even if the other side has reversed engineered it or independently developed it, they would still be infringing your patent. Whereas with a trade secret, um, uh, they would not. Uh, so if somebody comes up with the same idea that you've been keeping under lock and key for 20 years uh, uh, and, and don't have patent protection for it, only trade secret protection, they, they would be um, they would not be necessarily liable for, for infringing your trade secret if they independently arrived at it. Um, and finally, I want to talk about copyrights. Uh, copyrights also does not require registration in order for you to, uh, to own a copyright in your protected work. Uh, it protects uh, the original expression of an idea that is fixed to a tangible medium. So essentially, that's that's what you need to do is you need to come up with an original expression of an idea and then fix it to a tangible medium and voila, you have copyright protection. Um, so of course, registration, I'll talk about registration. You, 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 it does confer some benefits. Uh, so copyright generally covers uh, things that you're, you're probably familiar with uh, in, in terms of the copyright protection like art, music, uh, drawings, photographs, books, um, that sort of thing. What it does not cover are facts short phrases or slogans. 
you could have some protection if you if you have some creative creativity into the arrangement of certain facts, uh, but in general, facts by themselves are not um, not protected. Uh, if we can go back one slide, uh, the the copyright uh, uh, the copyrights confer a, bun a bundle of exclusive rights, uh, and and so it's not just uh, you know copyright meaning you're not it, others aren't allowed to copy your work. They're also not allowed to make derivative works from your work. They're not allowed to distribute copies or sell them without permission. They're not allowed to publicly perform your work or publicly display it, uh, and that's what we call a bundle of rights. Uh, let's go to the, ne the next uh, slide. The duration of a copyright for works created after January 1st, 1978 is typically author's life plus 70 years. Um, for, uh, for works uh, made for hire, that is works that, that are uh, owned by a company, uh, it's uh, uh, 95 years from the date of uh, first publication or 120 days from the date of creation, which is, whichever is shorter. Uh, for infringement, uh, we uh, courts typically look for substantial similarity and access. Uh, and there is, you may have heard of a fair use defense, um, which may, um, which may, you you may copy. Um, uh, if you're if you're being accused of infringement and you say, oh, I only copied one line out of this long book, you may have a fair use defense uh, in that case. But there are there's a, a, a four factors that you go through in order to determine that. And one of those is how much have you used of the work and whether that um, that portion that you've used. Uh, constitutes the, the, the heart of the work. Um, and so it's not just about the size, it's also about the, the value of, um, of that work, uh, of the portion that you've taken from the work. Um, and then registration, uh, as I said, it's not required in order for you to protect the work, but it is a prerequisite to filing a federal lawsuit. It allows you uh, to uh, claim statutory damages up to 150,000 for each copyright that is infringed. Uh, and it and gives you the potential to recover your attorney's fees. Um, and the best practice is to register your work and, and preferably within three months of publication in order to fully maximize uh, the benefits from the statute, uh, from the statutory um, registration. Um, and then finally, international copyright protection. Uh, the, uh, the US is a member of the Berne Convention, which I think essentially is a, it sets a minimum standard for member countries to, to provide protection for copyright in their, in their member states. Uh, and it provides reciprocity. Essentially, every, it requires the member states to give the same protection that they would give to, to, to their own uh, nationals. So, so if a foreign author uh, 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 publishes work in the U.S., then they would be provided. Uh, they can they can uh, have the same copyright protection that they would if uh, if a U.S. citizen um, came up with with uh, copyrighted work. Um, with that, I will turn it over to my partner Vlad uh, to talk about IP procurement and protection. Hey, Vlad. Um, yes. There you go. Great. Yeah. Tell, yeah, us, yeah. tell us what we have to do with the with the different governments here and how they how they step in to, to protect these rights that that need to be actually formally registered. Right. 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 I'll, I'll do a little bit more of a comparison and uh, getting your IP rights here. Uh, but first, I'd like to uh, in discussion of copyrights, uh, I'd like to highlight an interesting story that shows some of the differences differences between countries and then also just highlights uh, what uh, can happen uh, if you follow the rules, but sometimes perhaps there's some intended or unintended consequences uh, based on the law. So some of you may have seen this story back in uh, 2018 and it hit the news, uh, but essentially a uh, uh, monkey uh, macaque uh, named Narado, Narato, uh, I believe is how it's pronounced, uh, took uh, some selfies with a, a camera that a wildlife photographer had just left laying around. So then uh, later that photographer takes those selfies and publishes them in a, in a magazine and uh, PETA sues on, on the Rato's behalf. <clears throat> it appeals up to the Ninth Circuit and then the Ninth Circuit panel uh, holds, well, indeed, uh, Narado is the owner and the author of these works and of these photos and actually has suffered um, economic damage. So uh, under our laws, uh, Narato uh, does have Article 3 standing and should have the ability to sue. 
But the quirk here was that uh, the Copyright Act did not expressly authorize for an animal uh, to file a copyright uh, infringement suit. And so therefore, under the Copyright Act, uh, the uh, Nerado did not have statutory standing. And it, go, it goes to show that, uh, you know, perhaps <laughs> it would have been a different uh, consequence uh, given some of the same factors like PETA and ability to sue and standing in other countries, because US, for example, is a little bit unique in the fact that it uh, requires copyright registration in order to do certain things like sue and be able to recover damages. Uh, China, for example, does have a copyright registration system, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not a prerequisite to filing a lawsuit or obtaining damages. So, of course, you can't carry over the facts exactly into another country and see what happens. Uh, this is the real world based on real facts. Uh, but interestingly, in the US, it didn't work out. Perhaps it would have worked out in other countries. Um, so, in the US, at least, if you, uh, as Judge Gray had put it, if you, uh, if you let your dog out and it happens to take a selfie, feel free uh, to use it and post it on social media as you please. So uh, that, that was a little bit of a fun discussion about copyrights. Uh, let's now talk about uh, patents and uh, trademarks. So uh, I will be doing a little bit more of a comparison talk and can definitely answer more in depth questions later on. But kind of the, the big picture here is to realize that uh, patents uh, and trademark pathways uh, to protection overlap quite a bit, uh, but they are quite intricate um, and very date restrictive. So you have to know what you're doing. And of course, uh, your patent attorney is well aware of uh, your options as well as the steps that need to be taken. So uh, Barah had talked about patents and sort of the simplest form of filing for a patent is you file with a regional uh, patent office. And so for example, within the US, it happens to be the US, it's called the US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, other countries have similar type of offices set up. So, for example, in China, there is a patent office that you would file a uh, patent office or a uh, patent with. Uh, in Europe, of course, the European countries also have their own patent office and you do uh, similar types of filings. Now, certain countries have arrangements that they have uh, come together and put together uh, agreements where they're allowed to file or, or an applicant is allowed to file one application that covers multiple countries. So kind of the parallel to in the US, and of course, we're one country, right? Uh, that uh, we file one patent application uh, with the federal government and it provides you uh, protection in the 50 states. There's not quite a, such a parallel over in Europe, but the European countries have tried to develop something similar and they've set up, for example, a European patent office. And so what that allows you to do is to file one application and that helps you secure your patent rights within uh, particular countries in, in Europe that have signed up to this agreement, uh, there are some extra steps you have to take. So for example, you, you, uh, one thing to really keep in mind is that by filing this one application with the EPO, it doesn't secure your patent rights within all the European countries. There's extra steps you have to take to what's called validate in each specific European country of interest. So, um, one thing to, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not done with the slide. Yep, thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll be here for a little bit. I'll let you know when, when to uh, switch to the next slide. Uh, one thing to keep, keep in mind is that since you have all these pathways and options that they actually provide different types of protection sometimes and, and, and different uh, rights that you can obtain. So one example for, uh, is that uh, USPTO and EPO only allow you for utility patents versus some European countries and China will allow for utility models. And utility models, we didn't, uh, Barad didn't quite cover that, but that's that's kind of a, think of it as a lesser patent. It has, uh, it's almost like marginal inventions. They have less of a threshold to obtain a patent. And that's uh, to allow for companies to uh, obtain patent protection faster. And perhaps there is uh, some blatant infringer out there that they want to cover uh, and uh, they would like to move quickly. And so utility models are useful that way, but of course uh, there's pros and cons to everything and a utility model provides less broad of a protection than if you were able to obtain a utility patent uh, for it. So just things to keep in mind that there's of course always pros and cons to different options that you take. So now we just discussed filing in a particular country and that typically happens to be your home country or wherever you're based. 
but that doesn't uh, stop there with today's global economy, where you would probably want to file in, in multiple countries, depending on where perhaps you, you manufacture, where you sell, uh, etc. So uh, many of the countries I've set up where you can claim priority uh, to a home application or your original application and file in that other country uh, as if you had filed from day one within that other country as well. So for example, if you are based in the US, you file a US application and you file within 12 months. Uh, uh, the, the caveat here, and very important caveat is you have to do it within 12 months to claim priority. Within 12 months, you file in China and that uh, as it, it acts as if you had filed both in the US and China at the same day and you get your priority uh, back to that original filing date, which is important for patents in case somebody uh, comes along and uh, let's say has uh, filed for a patent before you, uh, or, or hopefully not, but let's say files in between that 12 month period, uh, you will have priority back to your original filing. So it can be quite important sometimes in a very competitive marketplace. Vlad, can I can I just interject yep. here um, to be clear? Because there was a question that came up. So, is, is this a two way street? Uh, you know, we, we we get the benefit if we file in the U.S. first and then China later. And is is the is the opposite true? Is it a kind of a mutual cooperation? Yes, there are some caveats that come into play. For example, foreign filing licenses, uh, depending on where the invention was made. Uh, so, if the invention was made in the U.S., but for some reason, and some companies do this, uh, they'll want to maybe perhaps file in China first. Uh, you can do that and then claim back or come back to the U.S. within 12 months. Uh, but you have to, uh, in certain countries like uh, both U.S. and China, but not all countries require require what's called a foreign filing license. And so you will first file with the U.S. Patent Office, uh, just a preliminary filing showing them, hey, I, 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 this invention was made in the U.S., but I'd like to first file it in China. And, and typically the U.S. Patent Office will grant you that fi a foreign filing license. The only time they won't is it, it has some kind of national security interest. So, for example, if you're in inventing the next uh, missile technology, they probably are not going to allow you to foreign file it. Uh, but other than that, for the most part, for most commercial purposes, yeah, it's no problem. Just you have to take a few extra steps. Right, but but if you start to say you're a Chinese national, you you file your patent in China first. Twelve months later, you get the benefit of these treaties to, if you file in the U.S. Oh yeah, so if, yeah, the, the question was a little simpler than I took it. Yes, yes, of course, it it works both both ways. Yep. And, so, and maybe maybe if I could inject one one more thing I didn't mention is uh, perhaps a very basic point is that patents are territorial in the sense that your US patent is no good anywhere outside the US and your Chinese patent is nowhere, no good anywhere outside of China. Um, so I just want to mention that. Yeah, and, and I guess that's that's actually a very important point and, and the premise of all of this and why you would, for example, be filing in certain uh, regional direct filing offices and then probably have to take extra steps uh, to get protection elsewhere out of that particular country, yes. Uh, a patent provides you protection only within that country's jurisdiction. Um, so, okay, uh, moving on, or not to not to the next slide, <laughs> I apologize. Let's move back. I, I want to, if we can go back one more, yep. Uh, so, no, uh, pa yep, patents, okay. So uh, the other option that you have is um, what's called a patent cooperation treaty uh, or PCT application. And essentially it is uh, 153 countries, nearly or sort of like the kind of the major uh, economic countries have signed on to this. And so it allows you to file a single international application uh, that's based on your home application. By home application, for example, for us, it could be uh, the US. And then within 12 months, in order to claim priority, like we talked about, you would file your PCT application. And what that allows you to do is to secure your patent rights uh, worldwide or, or, or within these 153 countries. Uh, you do have to take some extra steps in order what's called a, you file national phase application. So therefore it's not, it, it's, it's uh, the key word here is an international application. It's not an international patent. Uh, again, going back to what just Barra said, because patents are uh, geographically based or jurisdictionally based. And so therefore you have to take extra steps, but uh, countries that have signed up for this treaty uh, kind of, it, similar to what we discussed with the European Patent Office have given you an option to kind of take an easier route of applying in different various uh, countries. So, uh, so and, and, and one thing to mention though is uh, some major exceptions uh, that typically surprise some people or just 
when they're not aware or haven't gone through uh, the patent process uh, too much as um, like Taiwan is not uh, a party to this treaty and some South American and Middle Eastern countries. So you, you have to be cognizant of that, uh, that by filing a PCT application, that's not your one stop for everything. Um, it could be very well that uh, I, I, lots of companies have Taiwan manufacturing, right? And if that's the case, PCT is not gonna work for you. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. You know, you know, Vlad, I, I think uh, to leave time to we're running a couple of minutes behind here, leave time to make sure Johnson can get into the uh, protection in China. Why don't we jump over the trademark issues? Uh, okay. And, and uh, you know, I think I think we can just say there are treaties that allow uh, you know, international recognition of filings in in various other countries, kind of like the like the patent. Uh, system that that Vlad just described so that uh, there's a lot of collaboration and uh, kind of uh, a pathway uh, to, to get protection worldwide uh, based on uh, your filings in any any one country. And again, this is bilateral. So there's there's a motivation to uh, for everyone to play nice. But why don't we uh, why don't we turn it over to Johnson to tell us about uh, uh, how uh, the Chinese law uh, uh, works and in, in, on these key IP areas and you know to, to, to kind of contrast what we were talking about earlier Johnson you know the the US patent law has been around for centuries when when was it that uh, China first uh, enacted its patent uh, law? It, yeah it's 1985 it's only about 33 years ago yeah <laughs> okay so I think you'll after listening to Johnson you'll realize uh, China has come a very long way in those in those 33 years so Johnson go ahead yeah thank you thank you John you hello everyone you know this is Johnson speaking from Beijing and as John introduced at the very beginning I have almost 20 years working experience in IP field most likely I mean I'm working with the I mean overseas clients and uh, the most of uh, uh, frequently asked the question to me is always, I mean, from the overseas clients, always like that. Do you really have IP protection in China? Can I have my IP rights, I mean, protected in China seriously? So my answer is always yes, because I handled quite a lot of cases on this field. So I see quite a lot of cases we win on behalf of the overseas clients. So, but you need to know how to, you know, what is the rule behind and how to do it smartly. That is the key point. So today I'm going to show, show you, I mean, two parts of my presentation. The first part will be the overview of the patents and trademarks uh, and the trade secrets in China. You know, uh, we have uh, among various of the intellectual property rights in China, the currently the most interested uh, rights are for, I mean, four rights as uh, Barra introduced the patent trademark uh, copyrights and the trade secrets. So I'm gonna share some of my experience with you within the following, uh, I mean, next slide, please. Yeah, so the the first thing is that as uh, Bara and Vulan said, to, uh, to reinforce a right in China, you must have uh, established a right in China first. You know, as mentioned before, you know, for patent, for trademark, you have to apply before the Chinese Patent Office or Trademark Office. And when you get the rights granted or registered, you can enforce it. But for the uh, copyrights and the trade secrets, it is almost uh, established automatically. Uh, you know, for the, yesterday we talked about copyright. You know, in China, uh, there is a kind of the, what we call voluntary registration for the copyrights, but this is not absolutely absolutely necessary when you try to enforce it, as long as you can show your proof, I mean, evidence proving that you own the rights, you create the work, that will be okay. But it is highly recommend uh, to have your work, I mean, registered as a copyright in China. For the trade secrets, it's quite different because it is you know, built uh, automatically, but uh, it has to follow some rules, especially for this, I mean, uh, three conditions. So th that is basically the same thing as uh, Vara introduced the uh, next base. Yeah, this is the uh, legal basis when you are trying to, 
I mean, enforce IP rights in China. Uh, you know, China has different IP laws for patent, for trademark, you know, for copyright. But unfortunately, so far, we don't have a, a standalone law for the trade secret. Instead, the trade secrets is only under the anti-unfair competition law. Uh, there is a one article, you know, uh, stipulated in the unfair competition law. So as you can perceive, uh, enforcement of the, I mean, trade secrets should be not, I mean, not as strong, as powerful as that for the patent and the trademark. Yeah. And uh, of course, under certain, certain circumstances, uh, for example, if the damages or situation of the infringement is quite serious, you can also seek for the, uh, you know, help from the criminal law, which means under circumstances, you can send the infringers into jail. Okay, uh, I, I will not repeat, the, I mean, read this, but you can see um, what is the circumstances, especially for the damages. Okay, uh, next, please. Okay, so... Now we are going to talk about the, uh, uh, no, please, uh, uh, let's go back, go back. Uh, yes, this is right. Uh, when you are going to uh, enforce your IP rights in China, uh, it's quite different than the United States. You know, in China, we will always have two ways to enforce IP rights. One is the normal way, you know, civil actions, you know, lawsuits. And the other way is the administrative actions. This is very unique maybe all over the world but sometimes using administrative actions is much more effective than you know lawsuits because it's quite long and the cost you know less and uh, of course under the circum uh, certain circumstances you can seek for help by the crimi criminal law uh, uh, and uh, you know for the trade secrets we have uh, you know crime for infringement of the uh, trade secret, but for a patent, very rarely you will have a you know, criminal law to help you because this is only, uh, criminal can only control the pass off of the patent. Uh, next place. Okay, so this slide shows some difference between the uh, different roads. I mean, for enforcing IP rights in China, you know, for the civil actions, the advantage is that uh, the enforcement is quite strong. If we, you win the case and the defendants, I mean, refuse to follow the court ruling, you can ask the court to enforce it. Uh, that is a very good way. And uh, of course, the, 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 another advantage for the civil action is that you can claim damages, which means you cannot get back you know, the, the attorney fees, but also the, the damages for the infringement. Uh, but for the court actions, it's uh, a relatively long proceeding. Norm, uh, under normal uh, situation, you will have at least one year's waiting, I mean, for the first instance, and then I will introduce it later. But for the administrative actions, it is quite, quite fast. Uh, it's uh, faster than the civil action. It normally takes uh, about 90 days. I mean, three months, you can close the case. That's, that is a good way, but unfortunately, if you are going to go through the administrative actions, uh, no damages will be awarded. And besides, the administrative, I mean, administration of these actions, uh, they normally will have the case settled. Uh, very few of the administration like to make a decision of the infringement. That is the drawback. Uh, then the last, yeah, yes, this criminal criminal actions is long proceeding, but it's the should be the strongest way to enforce the immune rights because you will send somebody to jail, right? Yeah, next please. Yeah, this is a typical, you know, uh, proceeding in China. As you can, the first column is about court actions. That is the kind of the typical proceeding, of course, uh, to enforce IP rights. Uh, the most important thing is that you should have a solid evidence before lodging the actions. That is a little bit dif different than the United States because uh, as far as I know in the States, you can you know, have some very uh, I mean, preliminary uh, evidence and then you can go through the discovery 
procedure asking the defendant to show their evidence, to show all the things they cannot hide. But in China, the basic rule of the civil law is that all the burden of proof is on the plaintiff side. So that is quite you know, uh, difficult in some uh, circumstances. And the, the typical procedure is about if you got uh, solid evidence, you can go to the court for the first instance, second instance, then after two second instances, if any of the parties are still uh, not satisfied with the court decision, you can go to the Supreme Court for the judicial review. And uh, all like the same, same procedure. Uh, and uh, just one thing to be mentioned, that is uh, specifically for patent, because as you know, uh, in China, uh, under most circumstances, when you attack somebody for the patent infringement, the, uh, the defendant most likely will uh, counter strike by requesting your patent being invalid. So if this happens, it could cause a really long I mean, period. As you can see, for the invalidation procedure, you firstly go to the patent office, then you can appeal it from the first instance and the second instance and the uh, judicial review by the Supreme Court. Then if you plus all the proceedings for the full case of a patent, we have ever seen that before, there will be seven proceedings. Uh, it could, year, could take years. It's a long and uh, money, you, know, you have to be patient like that. The next please. So this is a, a data show in China. As you know, every year, the China Supreme Court will release an annual report for the IP protection uh, in China based on the last year data. And this is the data of the year of 2020, last year. As you can see, large number of the cases are copyright infringement cases, and then trademark, then patent. And for the anti-unfair competition cases, there are only 4,000, less than 5,000 cases. And uh, uh, we didn't see the, you know, we didn't see how many trade secrets related cases are included in this 4,000 cases because the Supreme Court, they didn't release this detailed data, but we believe the total number should be less than 500 cases. Yeah, uh, next please. So this is a data uh, which is quite interesting. You know, uh, before I drafted these slides, I talked with Bullard and uh, we are, I, I know most of clients, especially uh, for, for foreign clients, they are quite interesting to know a figure. Uh, how would be the uh, Chinese government or court? Uh, how would they there be fair to treat it to, to the foreign clients? Uh, I mean, especially, for the IP right enforcement. So this is a kind of uh, non-official data. This is a data is by a commercial database uh, concluded and uh, which shows from the year 2008 to 2018, the 10 years and all the patent related litigations involving US companies. Uh, this data shows this. And uh, to the left side is about administrative litigations which is uh, more specifically, which is related to the patent invalidation uh, proceedings, which means uh, if a US company is involved in the patent invalidation action, he can appeal, as I mentioned before, he can appeal before the courts. And uh, the left side shows, unfortunately, more than 80% more than 80 of the cases when the US company is involved in patent invalidation cases, they lost. Finally, so only 10%. That means if you are going to attack somebody's patent or you are going to defend your patent against others uh, attack, uh, most likely you will lose the case. I mean, lose the patent or you cannot get rid of others' patent. That is the problem. Maybe I think the, the reason is because of the, I mean, the basic patent system are a little bit dif different when taking the requirement of novelty and the inventive steps into consideration. They are quite different. Yeah, uh, this is not very good looking figure, but on the right side, as you can see, on the civil uh, lawsuit, I mean, uh, infringement case side, 
the, the figure looks pretty good. Uh, the buff is about uh, uh, figure one, a US company uh, involved in an uh, infringement case as a plaintiff. The rate of success is about 90, more than 90%. They win the case yeah, for the infringement. And uh, the, the, the bottom side is about, you know, one US company is involved as a defendant being accused by others for the patent infringement, the US companies, they also won more than 60% of the case. Yeah, next please. Yeah, this, this figure shows the trade secret uh, data, which is really interesting. As you can see, uh, this is also from a commercial data. It's not a complete data, but it's just a partial of the data. And you can see from the year of 2015 to 2019, each year, uh, the public, uh, publicly disclosed, uh, I mean, trade, trade secret cases, I mean, litigation cases, are only hundreds of them. I mean, 300, 400, are always like this. And uh, on the right side, as, as you can calculate, uh, for these five years, there are totally around uh, 600 cases, right, for the trade secret infringement. And uh, on the right side, as you can see, uh, when you take the color of purple and green uh, into consideration, there are less than 30% of the trade secret cases for which the court made a decision which means the other cases are also are all neither uh, either you know withdrawn or re, or just uh, you know not instituted instituted so and um, within this 30% of the cases for which the court make the decision only 10% of the cases uh, the plaintiff wins so from this data you can see uh, the, the, to enforce a trade secret in china is really difficult uh, mostly because uh, you know, to enforce the trade secret, you are not going to uh, only, not going to, I mean, not only to prove there is the infringement, but the biggest problem is to, is to prove you own a trade secret, right of trade, trade secret. So that is my, you know, okay. So I, I think my talk on this, so we're and uh, th thank you, Johnson. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit here about uh, enforcing uh, patent rights in some other countries. Uh, but before I jump into that, we're, we're getting close toward the end of the program. We've gotten a few questions uh, that we're going to be happy to answer. If uh, anyone has any other questions, uh, please uh, please type them in. I'll I'll, uh, I'll, ad I'll address. We had one interesting question, which is. Uh, you know, can, can the president uh, unilaterally uh, waive uh, the patent rights for uh, COVID-19 vaccines? Uh, and uh, that's really an interesting issue. It, honestly, it's unprecedented. And uh, I think there's there will be some serious legal challenges if he does that without uh, some due process, give the uh, pharmaceutical company some opportunity to, uh, to uh, have a uh, a chance to uh, present on that. There were uh, there there were exemptions in World War II. Uh, you know, there were War, war Powers Acts that uh, forced some patents uh, to be uh, to be used for you know defense products, and, and I imagine th th you, there would be some background there. But I don't. I, I, I short answer is I don't know the real answer, but I think it will be very difficult for it to be done simply by the stroke of the presidential pen and. Uh, uh, I would be very sad. I would be sad to see it happen at all, and, and even sadder to see it happen uh, that, that easily because uh, those companies invested a lot of money to develop that technology, and uh, it would, to me, be very unfair to see it uh, all the fruits of their labor be being taken away. I think if the U.S. government wants to uh, uh, provide uh, economic support to other countries or other purchasers of those vaccines, uh, that's the way they should do it. They should provide uh, subsidies uh, to buy it at the market price, but they shouldn't strip the patents away from the patent owner. Um, okay, that's my editorial. Uh, real quickly, uh, we talked about how the patents are really territorial. So, uh, you know, to infringe a US patent, someone has to be making, using, or selling the patented product in the US. That's pretty much the case in, in, uh, with all our major trading partners. 
And, and if you have a situation where the products launched nationwide, where are you going to go to sue? Well, in the U.S., you know, you're, you're going to have a jury that can decide the case. Uh, you can challenge whether the patent is valid in court, even though the patent office issued it, you can challenge it in court or you can go to the patent office and challenge it. Um, but your chances of getting an injunction, you know, a court order stopping it are not as high as they used to be. And, and uh, you, you may well get uh, some, uh, some damages, some big damages in case you're in front of a jury. But the case is legally expensive. Why? We have a long discovery process. Uh, the, the legal fees will add up. Whereas in Europe, uh, and Germany's a real popular location, um, the proceedings are streamlined. They don't have live witnesses. They don't have juries. They'll give injunctions early on, which is good on the one hand. It's bad on the other hand if you get sued by someone who's considered a patent troll. Uh, and the Germans are changing their laws to make it harder to get an injunction if you are just somebody who bought a patent, but you're not a real competitor and you're trying to uh, demand uh, license fees. So uh, Germany moves fast. You can get injunctions, not a lot of damages, but it's uh, the legal fees are low. Netherlands, similarly, but what they've done, and, and again, to give you an idea of this, this competition between the countries, Netherlands, uh, you can get an injunction, not only in Netherlands, they're, they're willing to issue an injunction that says you can't sell the infringing product in other European Union countries either. So they're trying to reach beyond their borders and, and, and that has made their court procedures attractive uh, and uh, is uh, really uh, an interesting development. But so what did the US do in response to this? It's kind of cheap to litigate in Germany. So uh, if we go to the next slide, there's a new procedure where you can go back to the US Patent Office uh, and um, uh, Sydney, if you could advance the slide, um, if you, you, you can go to the patent office and ask the patent office to review the patent that they issued. And um, uh, that proceeding is a much more streamlined proceeding. And it started only in 2012. And, and there's now, um, it basically started to cannibalize the uh, lawsuits that would be in, in US federal court for patent infringement. So there's now over, there's about 1,500 of these patent office proceedings challenging validity in court. And we've seen the number of patent uh, lawsuits drop by that amount. Why? The patent office, again, lower cost, faster, less discovery, and uh, uh, you know, a quicker, a quicker uh, path to the result. So uh, yeah, yeah here's, here's the slide. The, in blue, we see the district court cases down uh it's dramatically since uh 2013 highs and in green we see these patent office challenges they're called post-grant review so that's that's really been uh a, a big development there um i uh i i want to uh i want to make sure we get to the questions i and i want to one of the questions i wanted to ask is whether uh, you know bra you mentioned that uh, you know the patent doesn't help you uh, unless it's in your country uh, but can you just touch real briefly, Bara, on what happens if somebody is importing into the U.S. a product that's made overseas? Is, is there anything you can do short of going to, to, to the country of manufacture and uh, suing them or, or, or suing them in one of these long drawn out lawsuits like I've mentioned? Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, so there is this uh, this uh, International Trade Commission that is available as a forum for patent owners. Uh, and we, if we can go back one slide, one slide before this. Yes, that's nope. Should be slide number forty-one. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the International Trade Commission is an administrative agency in, in D.C. It's not an Article III court. Uh, it's basically under the Department of Commerce, um, where you can go and, and essentially file a, a complaint and ask for, the, the, um, ask for an investigation, I, guess, I think is what they call it. Um, and and um, uh, essentially, uh, you, get a, you get an evidentiary hearing before an administrative law judge, not a jury. Uh, and, uh, and there is this other party called the Office of Unfair Import In Investigations that's also involved. So there's, there's typically uh, you, the complainant, uh, the respondent uh, company that's importing, and then this uh, Office of Unfair Import Investigations that uh, provides its own sort of uh, um, briefing on, on the issues in the case. 
the big takeaway from this is the available remedies. Uh, you don't get damages here. The whole point of, of this proceeding is to stop the importation, as John said. This is where you can you can um, get uh, get an exclusion order. Uh, there's two types of them. There's a general exclusion order, which prohibits importation of the patented article by any company, or a limited exclusion order, which is which prohibits importation of the patented article by a certain company that that'll be that would be named. Um, and you can get a cease and uh, desist order directing uh, uh, directed to U.S. companies to prevent sales of articles uh, that have already entered the U.S. Um, so that's that's the, the main uh, uh, sort of um, structure and purpose of it. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, the, the main differences between asserting your rights in uh, the ITC versus uh, going the district court route uh, is you have, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, uh, you have a domestic industry requirement, which is uh, you're required to show that uh, that there is a, an, a patented article in the US that meets the, the limitations of the, of the claims in the patent and that you have a significant economic investment in, uh, in that product. So it, either sort of a manufacturing or, or that type of uh, economic investment. And there are some specific requirements for that. Um, it does have the advantage of being a quicker forum. So it's, uh, it's a 15 to 18 month uh, resolution. Uh, and that's by statute. It has to, there has to be a final determination by a certain date. Um, uh, and so that, that sort of some, some patent owners like the, uh, the, the quick turnaround. Um, uh, the, on the flip side, there are no monetary damages, only the exclusionary remedies that I explained, um, and there's also no preclusive effect. So the ITC, because it's an administrative agency, doesn't can't tell a district court what to do, and so a district court can look at the same issues and decide differently at a later time. Great, Bro, um, let, let me jump in here because I, I, I want to get to a couple more questions here, and then we can come back. I, I just my, my one comment is. I, I always get a kick out of the, the International Trade Commission because it's it's the full name is the United States International Trade Commission. There's really <laughs> it's a U.S. government agency. It's not you know it's not like the Hague uh, or, or something you know it's not a, it's not the a world court, but it sounds like it is. But it really is designed to promote U.S. industry uh, and uh, you know protect against unfair competition. You know and. IP infringement being one of those things that they consider to be unfair competition. But let, let me hit one of these questions here, which is uh, what are some of the challenges in providing sufficient evidence to demonstrate patent infringement? And that's a really interesting question because uh, the courts in the US are requiring that we present more and more of that evidence, even at the very outset of the lawsuit when we file a complaint, not, not just at the trial. And uh, I'd say some of the biggest challenges are uh, the, uh, the information that you cannot easily learn from inspecting a product. And as products get more sophisticated with software, uh, they are in, and, and, and many, many times the, uh, the patent is on a software system, a, a network. Uh, it's often difficult to understand exactly how it is programmed. And we, we basically, we do a lot of forensic testing uh, that's why it's important that uh, our lawyers have technical backgrounds. We also work with technical experts and, and test products. Uh, and we look for, basically, we look for clues that products operate in a certain way. We, we dig up public information, uh, you know, product manuals, user guides. Uh, there's usually a fair amount of information that gets shared between a manufacturer and its customers. Uh, so we try to get that information, uh, even though we may not be a customer. And, uh, and, and so uh, the, the other place where it's really challenging uh, is if the patent is on a, a process and you can have a patent on a, on a manufacturing process. So take a computer chip, there can be steps in the process to manufacture a computer chip that make it uh, pack more transistors into a smaller area. And uh, you can look at the final product and the final chip and say, well, they've, they've packed the transistors in uh, densely enough. We don't think there's any way to do it other than by our process, but you don't know <laughs> what process they used inside their manufacturing plant, protected by trade secrets. And that's, uh, again, uh, an area where we have to do, a, do investigation, look at the other company's patent filings themselves. Sometimes we get clues from that. And so uh, th those are the kinds of things that we look at. 
Um, so I, uh, yeah, we had, we had, we had, we have more that we'd be really happy to talk about, but, uh, uh, I know that, uh, we, we, uh, are, are, uh, this was when we were scheduled for me to say, thank you so much for your attention. And I'm glad you came and, uh, and, and Nora Valenzuela from the Orange County World Affairs Council or the, the current, uh, president of the group wanted to say a few words, but, uh, if you want to give us more time, we're happy to answer more questions or. Yes. Uh, you have 10 more minutes, actually. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, OK, so let me um, uh, throw one question uh, out. John, may I ask a question? Oh, certainly. You know, I'm. what if, that's always a good start, what if you have a country, the 153 jurisdictions that are on this program, but what if you have one of them that simply ignores the uh, enforcement or sanctions, that they just decide not to follow what kind of what kind of redress do you have if you have a country that's simply thumbing its nose at the whole thing yeah well th then you get into the world of diplomacy and and politics in, in terms of uh whether the united states is is going to permit all sorts of other trade with that country uh to proceed without things like uh prohibitive tariffs, right? We're not gonna allow their products to be imported to the, into the US without uh, uh, tariffs and, and uh, you know, potentially other kinds of um, you know, sanctions. So that's, that's really uh, something that the individual um, uh, owners of the IP, the, the, the patent owners or the trade secret owners, uh, really that's, that's when they need to be writing to their, their congressperson and uh, trying to uh, get the, you know, the US uh, uh, you know, trade policy aligned. And that is a, that is a lot of uh, what our trade policy, uh, you know, IP is a, is a big component of our trade policy. And if there's somebody who's not respecting uh, IP the way our, our, our uh, trading partners, our, our, our good trading partners are, are respecting it, then um, uh, there are different, uh, you know, tools in, in, in the bag of the diplomats. Uh, and, uh, but that's a little beyond, above our pay grade. <laughs> so, I think. so John, if I can uh, answer a quick question here uh, to clarify something that's, I think, related. So somebody asked, uh, what South American countries don't respect patent protection uh, that Vlad I described? It, I, I, the reason I want to bring this particular question up is it's not a matter of uh, respect. Uh, in many countries, you can uh, file patent uh, applications to get patent protection for. It's just more of a question that those countries uh, sign on to this treaty to agree to certain terms. Um, and so, so uh, the, the difference, the main difference here, and I think what Judge Gray asked is, for example, in countries where uh, they've agreed to certain rules, and it might not even be the PCT application, they might not be one of those 153 countries, uh, but they just are not respecting IP rights. Um, uh, but the, the, the different question here, I think that's related to the PCT, is that a country that has a patent system and very well may provide good IP or patent protection rights uh, for their uh, citizens as well as uh, any foreigners may not be a party to a PC, the PCT. And so you don't need, uh, the country doesn't actually have to be a party to the PCT in order to write patent protection. And Taiwan is one example. Taiwan definitely has a patent system. You can apply for a uh, patent in Taiwan uh, but, but they just don't sign on to the uh, treaty, uh, uh, the PCT treaty. Uh, and then related to that, I guess, to answer more concretely what South American countries are not part of the PCT. Uh, some examples are like Bolivia, Venezuela, and that's actually an easy Google question. If you have specific countries of interest, just type in uh, what countries are not part of the PCT. Thanks. So, you know, uh, if I've got a couple of minutes, I, I would like to jump to slide 48 here and, and just talk about trade secrets for a minute, because I think this does uh, get to this, this question. Uh, we, there's a lot of concern about international espionage and whether, uh, the, you know, trade secrets are, are being stolen from U.S. companies uh, and taken overseas. Uh, and, and that's an area where when we talk about di diplomacy and getting the attention of, of Congress, 
um, they're, they're already laser focused on this and, and have been for some time. Uh, in 1996, they, the Economic Espionage Act was introduced. This made criminal federal penalties for trade secret misappropriation uh, with uh, extra penalties if, it, if the misappropriation was done to benefit a, a, a foreign uh, uh, agency and uh, you know penalties in, in the order of ten million dollars and fifteen year jail time. Um, the the fe- there was a federal uh, civil trade secret law that was enacted five years ago, and so this took us from uh, individual states having their own trade secret laws uh, to uh, being able to sue in federal court uh, and uh, potentially get uh, you know a seizure order where the court would allow you to enter uh, the the misappropriators premises and, and, and uh, take uh, uh, what they what they stole from you back. Um, and uh, there's still a, a stream of new proposals that are coming up uh, in, in Congress on that if we could advance the slide. Uh, a lot of and, and quite frankly, a lot of it is is focused on China. Um, and uh, so Sydney, the next slide talks about a couple of these more recent proposals, beef up the ITC, uh, so that uh, they already move fast, but they would have the ability to move even faster when the allegation is, is that a, a foreign uh, competitor uh, misappropriated trade secrets. Uh, there's uh, other policies that are being discussed. And, and some of this is, you know, form a committee, do a resolution. Some of it is, uh, has more teeth to it. So uh, it's it's getting a lot of attention. If we go to the next slide, I'd like to leave with some takeaways here uh, on, on the trade secret area because there is a lot of concern that people are stealing U.S. trade secrets and taking them overseas. And uh, what's really important to remember is that the trade secrets are only as good as the efforts you make to maintain secrecy. So uh, unlike your 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 patent or trademark that can get registered, it's not clear you own a trade secret until you go to court and prove it. And in order to prove it, you've got to show that you've made really good efforts uh, to, to maintain secrecy. And so you can, uh, if you've done that, you can, you can get busy federal prosecutors to help you bring criminal cases, but you're going to be a lot more sympathetic if you've done a good job on your end. Uh, and you know, I'd, I'd analogize this to if, you're, if your house got broken into and, and your jewelry got stolen and you were asking the police to, to you know, make a thorough investigation, um, did you lock your front door? Did you put the jewelry in a safe? D- do, you, do you have a security camera outside your front door? Uh, if, you have, if you've done all those things, I think it's gonna be a lot easier to, to interest the police in, in prosecuting the case. And that's the same kind of thing here. And, uh, you know, Fundamentally, there's a question as to whether you have a property right in the jewelry, <laughs> the jewelry here being the trade secret. You don't even have a property right if you haven't taken these steps in advance. So limit who you disclose the trade secrets to. Keep it to a small group on a need to know basis. Use written non-disclosure agreements. Make sure your employment agreements are very specific and the employees acknowledge that they need to maintain confidentiality and that they respect the trade secrets. When the, entroy, when the employee leaves, do an exit interview, remind them again, make them check all the different devices that they have. It used to be, uh, you know, now with the computers and smartphones, uh, you know, people may not even know that they have all sorts of trade secrets uh, at home with them. It used to be you'd have to sneak into the office at night or into the lab with a flashlight and grab a bunch of files and walk out the door. Now it's happening uh, automatically and people don't even realize it. Uh, But I can tell you, I I handle a lot of cases where employee leaves company A, goes to company B, they, they start competing and it becomes problematic when that employee turns out has a hard drive full of all the work they did at the previous employer. So expect, you know, that, and it could be in good faith. It could be not, they may not even be aware about it until I start asking. So, uh, you know, be aware of that. But just in general, I mean, there are people of all stripes and colors who are, would be happy to steal your trade secrets. <laughs> so know your business partners, know who you're dealing with uh, in advance. And um, the, there's potential thieves out there everywhere. My, my, I had a very big case against uh, a Canadian company. Uh, that uh, uh, 
stole trade secrets. Uh, we got over a hundred million dollars from them for this. And it was uh, very uh, deceptive, I would say, because they were helping my client build prototypes. And they just, they didn't tell us that the engineer that was building the prototypes to our trade secret specifications was sometimes on the very same day and in the very same notebook, working on his competing design <laughs> of the product that he was prototyping for us. Uh, and so uh, this can happen right under your nose and it's, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the trade secret law helps those who help themselves. And so while there's certainly uh, bad actors uh, all around the world, uh, and there, there's plenty of them right here in, 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 in North America too. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, it, there, there's, and, and the good news is there are, there's lots of legal remedies as I hope we've, we've made you aware of here today. So that's, uh, I think that's a good spot to, to end it at. Uh, I want to, uh, thank, uh, the world affairs council again for giving us this opportunity and, uh, really appreciate having a chance to, to share with all your members. And back to, back to you now, Nora. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. On behalf of the uh, Board of Trustees of Board of Fair Council and also our wonderful staff and executive board, uh, board, I wish to thank all of you for our distinguished speakers, panelists, for knowledgeable and informative um, information. Really appreciate that. I also like to thank Judge Gray, I know Judge Gray and I started this three years ago for our partnership. So when I saw John and Barad 